I think that's looking pretty good now. So um, yeah, apologies everyone for the incorrect email link in the email. Uh, glad you all found your way here in the end. Um, okay, so it's it's a pleasure today to have uh, Inte uh, Young join us to give the lunch talk. Um, so Inte is a uh, postdoc at NASA Goddard, um, where he works with Amber Strong. And his work focuses on looking at uh, um, galaxies in the very high redshift universe. So he's done a lot of work uh, using the Kendall's um, HST imaging. Uh, and in particular, he's going to tell us today uh, about using Lyman alpha observations to probe the error of reionization. So I can tell you, take it away. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for kind introduction. And uh, I'm very glad uh, that I can have this chance for giving my talk today at Carnegie Observation, but virtually. <laughs> so um, today uh, I will talk about the probing the era of reionization with Lyman alpha observations, uh, which include my previous work and ongoing projects. Uh, there is a list of collaborations shown here, uh, which include also HST Cycle 23 uh, clear collaboration team. Uh, so it's been three years already from my last visit to uh, Carnegie in 2019. And so I will start uh, with a brief introduction and the summary of my previous work uh, to remind you and to discuss the, what, what's been updated from my latest work. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so here I brought a movie to show the, uh, how the reionization might have happened. And this movie was created by the Sphinx collaboration team uh, from cosmological radiative hydrodynamical volume simulation to simulate the reionization of neutral hydrogen in intergalactic medium. So what's been shown here. So as time goes by, the matters are collapsed to form the dense regions where the universe started to form the first stars and galaxies. And the blue colored areas are showing the neutral gas and the ionized bubbles are shown as the white bubbles. And the red color that represents the shock heated gas by supernova explosion as massive stars evolve. So the reionization is the last major phase transition of the intergalactic medium. So uh, that's predicted by modern cosmology. So as this movie shows, the process of reionization uh, is also reflecting the formation of stars and galaxies in the early universe, as well as being interested in the modern cosmology. And so therefore, it's crucial to investigate the detailed timeline and uh, the spatial evolution of the cosmic reionization uh, that is not only for providing important observation of proof of the modern cosmology, but also for understanding the formation of galaxies and stars in the early universe. Yeah, so uh, how we can trace the neutral hydrogen uh, for studying reionization. So in, in brief, the Lyman alpha is the strongest emission line and that is detect detectable from high redshift galaxies. And the Lyman alpha photons are easily scattered by neutral hydrogen. So uh, the observation of Lyman alpha can be utilized as a tracer of neutral gas of the IGN. So specifically getting into the reionization, the Lyman alpha photons have extra opacity from diffusion neutral hydrogen gas in the IGM. So as shown in this cartoon figure, so if the galaxy is surrounded by neutral medium uh, like this, and those Lyman alpha photons are scattered out from our line of sight. But we can observe the Lyman alpha from these galaxies, which reside in the ionized bubbles. So such a strong dependence of Lyman alpha visibility at the epoch of reionization provide a useful tool for tracing H1 gas in the IGM with the Lyman alpha spectroscopy. So uh, one popular way so far is measuring the Lyman alpha fraction. So that is the number of Lyman alpha emitting galaxies among the entire observed Lyman alpha galaxies. And this figure from 
Masami Uchi's uh, recent review paper that shows the redshift evolution of alignment of perfection, which shows the increase at lower redshifts, but the rapid drop between redshift six and seven. Uh, the conventionally diffraction uh, should increase with increasing redshifts as the galaxies are expected to have less amount of dust uh, in the early universe, uh, which allows the escape more alignment of photons. However, the measurements that shows the rapid drop uh, at, re oh, sorry, at redshift of seven, and that can be uh, interpreted as an increasing amount of uh, neutron hydrogen in intergalactic medium. Yeah, so uh, along with that uh, recent studies, uh, I try to implement a little more uh, detailed analysis of our spectroscopic data. Uh, that is a little different way. Um, now that is for constraining the Lyman alpha equivalent with distribution. So instead of measuring Lyman fraction, and the, the strong motivation of studying equivalent with distribution instead of Lyman alpha fraction is that uh, it utilizes more information from spectroscopic observations. You know, for, for instance, Lyman alpha flux and uh, galaxy UV continuum level, and also uh, the number of detection itself. So, and also the distribution itself that represents a statistical uh, distribution of alignment alpha as well. Um, and this alignment alpha equivalent width distribution has been well studied at lower redshifts, and it's often described with the folding scale. So, and that is characterized with the folding scale with W naught here. And on the right figure, uh, I'm showing the redshift evolution of the folding scale of the distribution. So uh, what's shown in this right panel, uh, the figure is taken from uh, Santa Sierra 2020. So it's the evolution of the folding scale as a function of redshifts. Uh, it does not change very much over time uh, from redshift 0.3 up to redshift 6. So the measurements are around 60 Armstrong or around 100 Armstrong. So that's interesting. Yeah, however, the, how does it change it into the epoch of reionization? So the neutral hydrogen atoms in intergalactic medium would be diminished alignment of uh, emission strengths, so which lower the characteristic defaulting scale width. So the shown in these two figures from TLB et al. and Mason et al the reionization models predict the higher uh, neutral hydrogen fraction would hinder the lemon alpha photons passing the IGM, so which would reduce the folding scale of the distribution in, in this way. So this expectation provides us the research question here. So how does the folding scale width would be evolving into the epoch of reionization, particularly at redshift of six from our lemon alpha observations? So it's a very simple question. Yeah, so in order to do that, so we performed the spectroscopic observation with CAT Deimos and MOS fire for around the 200 galaxies at redshift six to eight. Uh, those are selected from uh, photometrically selected catalog uh, based on Kendall's survey. Um, and this figure shows the overall design in good south and good north field. And most of our data set shown as the green rectangles are published in my uh, first survey paper in 2018. And the, particularly the most of our observations are one of the deepest and comprehensive observations for Lyman Alpha at these redshifts. And the mask configuration provides overlapping areas which provide the most Deepest, uh, deepest observations for four targets with 16 hours integration time. And that is, uh, that discovers a clear asymmetric feature of alignment alpha emission line published in 2019. And the entire spectroscopy uh, analysis published the last year in my uh, paper. So, and this two table shows the brief outline of the survey. And uh, I will start 
to discuss the result from the constraining the equivalent view distribution at redshifts around 6.5, that is from DEMOS observation. So the wavelength coverage of the DEMOS uh, H4 Lyman alpha emitters between redshift 6 to 8. So the, the measurement from the DEMOS can be utilized to put in constraint on, on the evolution of Lyman alpha equivalent with at the redshifts. And so we detected only five number of em emission lines from the entire survey, which is a small number of detections. Uh, however, uh, we uh, tried to constrain the evolution of equivalent with distribution with just handful number of detections. So what, it, uh, what we did for uh, doing that is introducing uh, our uh, new methodology for constraining the distribution uh, of a Lyman alpha equivalent width uh, by simulating the expected number of detections. So uh, this is basically for considering the data incompleteness. For instance, uh, photometric relative uncertainties and the dependence on object UV continuum level and also uh, observational conditions uh, in the spectroscopic data. So uh, I, I will skip the details uh, uh, as I, I discussed in the uh, five years. And the important thing is that, so we simulate the mock emission lines for the actual data set uh, to, uh, to estimate expected number of data set and expected number of Lyman alpha detections as a function of signal to noise level, depending on uh, what shape of Lyman alpha equivalent width distribution. So the folding scale shown here, that's the free parameter and which I wanna uh, constrain with a data set. So by changing the folding scale, uh, we provide a different expected number of Lyman alpha emitters as a function of signal to noise level. So with a choice of large equivalent uh, folding scale, you know, we'd expect to see more Lyman alpha emitters and vice versa. Uh, and so in constructing this uh, template, uh, simulated template, we fit this uh, template to the actually uh, detected uh, Lyman alpha data set, uh, as you shown the red curve here. So uh, we fit this simulated uh, template uh, to the data set, uh, the observed data set to find the best fit value for the uh, evolving scale risk. So I'm gonna skip the detail, uh, but what do you draw from that? Mm, the, uh, the fitting, uh, the our analysis we from our analysis we obtained the one sigma upper limit for the folding scale at around six uh, thirty six Armstrong, uh, and that is shown in this bottom panel. So uh, this is this is showing the redshift evolution again uh, for the folding scale, and. As I mentioned, uh, looking at the one sigma per limit, uh, that is just suggesting the reduced value of this folding scale com compared to the lower redshifts. But still, uh, thinking about the, the two sigma per limit, so it's a significant is just too low with the limited data set, as, as we only utilize uh, the few number of alignment parameters from the entire data set. So, however, the more excitingly, the, uh, our MOSFET near infrared observations allow us to explore this at even higher redshifts with better confidence. Um, so, here to constrain uh, equivalent with distribution of Lyman alpha at redshifts of seven, so we have obtained uh, deep near infrared spectroscopic data for 72 galaxies at redshift level of seven in Gus North field. So it's obtained through uh, more than 10 nights of observation with the six uh, different mask designs. And this table shows the summarize of the observations. So overall, the individual target was observed to around nine hours on average. So here, uh, I'm, excitingly, I'm, I'm presenting the individual spectra of the 10 Lyman alpha emitters detected from our MOSFET observations. And these are the, obviously the largest number of spectroscopic confirmation ever at this redshift sub of seven. 
so uh, this provides the largest uh, compilation of laminar parameters in the reionization era. And uh, one of the notable features from our laminar parameters, so here in, in this uh, figure, which shows the equivalent risk of lyman alpha as a function of redshifts and as a function of UV magnitude, uh, uh, we detect these six lyman alpha emitters, uh, which have equivalent risk above 50 angstrong. So uh, previously, the strong lyman alpha emission line is not expected, particularly into the probable reionization, but they are there. And particularly, this object with the equivalent risk of 280 Armstrong, that is very uh, extreme and interesting object. And without an Asian activity, uh, people have been thinking uh, it might require the extreme young and starburst T population with low mass metallicity to explain uh, such large equivalent risk value. So uh, in order to understand uh, the nature of this extreme object, uh, we observed it with Gemini uh, genus uh, spectral graph spring this year, and the data set is still being analyzed. So stay tuned for the further news about that object. So uh, that's about the new detections. And lastly, the, we performed the same analysis to constrain the equivalent with distribution uh, with our bus data dataset. So this is basically uh, creating the, another template set of the simulated laminar uh, emission lines from our spectroscopy observations. And we try to find the best fit of the equivalent with distribution to reproduce the observed emission lines from our mobile data. And our analysis suggests uh, the folding scale uh, of the laminar for distribution at this redshift that is around 32 Armstrong at redshift 7.6. So that is shown here uh, in this bottom panel. This figure again shows the folding scale evolution as a function of redshifts. So, um, our measurement from DEMOS, uh, which is green here, and from MOSFIRE, the red here, that is indicating that uh, this quantity uh, was reduced at redshift level of six compared to the lower redshift values. So, um, Simply that's suggesting the increasing amount of neutral hydrogen, but uh, we tried here uh, to perform a more interesting uh, estimate relating to IGM neutral fraction. So, so far uh, our primary result uh, of the study is about equivalent with distribution. Uh, however, from that measure, uh, we are able to draw the neutral hydrogen fraction of the IGM uh, to see if our measurement suggests to, uh, the same uh, same amount of neutral hydrogen compared to the other recent laminar studies, uh, likely from the Mason et al. or Hogue et al., uh, which suggests highly a uh, highly neutral IGN at the same redshifts. So, in order to do that, the key quantity uh, we need to draw uh, from our analysis is the laminar alpha transmission. So in the IGN. So that is described in the radiative equation here. Uh, and that can be empirically derived from our observation uh, as shown here. So the, the empirically measured transmission can be measured as the observed value divided by intrinsic value. Uh, but from our observation, uh, we are able to uh, estimate this uh, equivalent width. However, the, it is impossible directly measure measuring the intrinsic equivalent width at these redshifts because uh, those those are already impacted by the IG. So instead, uh, we took lower redshift value of this equivalent width at redshift below six by assuming the no significant evolution of the ISM and CGM properties between the different redshifts. I mean, there could be too much simplicity assumptions, but uh, it's the current limit of the study. So, uh, and, and uh, we measure this uh, IGN transmission as it is, and to, to link this value to the 
H1, the neutral hydrogen fraction, we still need ionization models, so which describe the Lyman alpha optical depths uh, through the CGM and IGM, depending on the reionization history. So that can be modeled through a more realistic numerical simulation. Uh, however, it can be also uh, simplified with analytic approach as shown here, uh, that is taking the average neutral hydrogen fraction. So uh, this equation simply des describes the IGM uh, optical depth depending on the neutral hydrogen fraction, as well as the velocity offset of Lyman alpha, which is describing the dependence of the size of ionized bubble. So in order to include the dependence of ionized bubbles or the, uh, to model the evolution of ionized uh, bubble sizes, we, we took the Falanero errors, uh, Falanero and O's reionization model, uh, which provide the characteristic size of ionized the bubbles as a function of uh, redshifts. So um, uh, I cannot describe it in the, uh, all the detailed measurement here, but uh, in short, from utilizing this description, uh, uh, we are putting our measurement on the constraint on optical depth based on this IGM transmission, and which constrain the neutral hydrogen fraction with the assumption of the ionized bubble sizes from the reionization model. So uh, from this approach, uh, our uh, analysis provides inferred neutral hydrogen fraction, which is around 50% at redshift of around 7.6. The interesting thing, this is much lower than the other recent studies. So from our study, we are suggesting that our observation providing uh, rather highly ionized structures compared to the other studies, which might demonstrate an homogeneous nature of reionization. So um, summarizing the previous work, uh, the comparison between the all recent Lyman alpha studies suggests very you know, more complicated picture of reionization. Uh, on the left, I'm showing the neutral fraction measurements uh, of the interacting medium uh, from the various studies. And focusing here, redshifts around the seven to eight, uh, these are Lyman alpha studies, including my measurements here, shows disagreement between their measurements. And furthermore, uh, on the right, which is showing a set of quasar Lyman alpha damping ring analysis, which provide the neutral fraction measurements as well. Um, their measurement also show the largest scatter of the IGM neutral fraction at the same redshifts. So such a disagreement between the IGM neutral fraction measurements uh, directly suggests that the reionization did not occur uniformly, but rather in an in homogeneous way. So um, in the same context, the, the various observations observational studies of Lyman alpha emitters have provided a more accumulating evidence for that inhomogeneous reionization caused by individual or groups of bright galaxies in the middle phase of reionization. Um, for example, there are recent findings of clustered Lyman alpha emitters from brighter galaxies. So at redshift 7.7 .7 from Kilbiara 2020, they found protocluster structures of Lyman alpha emitters. Uh, and also from the uh, Hue et al. 2021, they also detect uh, the large uh, Lyman alpha protocluster structures at around the redshift 6.9. And the clustered Lyman alpha emitters at the similar redshifts also reported in another recent study of An An uh, Ansley's 2021. And lastly, I want to highlight a highly ionized structures with four clustered Lyman alpha emitters at redshifts around the 7.5 to 7.6. Uh, that is from my recent study. Uh, also suggest enhanced Lyman alpha visibility from these four galaxies that are clustered in the nearby. So all of these recent findings suggest the accelerated reionization nearby the clustered bright galaxies. 
Um, and the, being motivated by these recent findings, we attempt to conduct the statistical analysis of Lyman alpha equivalent distribution, uh, which is also dependent on uh, galaxy UV brightness. So in order to see if the Lyman alpha transmission varies depending on the galaxy's UV luminosity. So in order to do that, we utilize the spectroscopic data set of HST uh, slit list creation survey, and that's called CLEAR. And the CLEAR is the candles Lyman alpha emission at reionization experiment, uh, which, which is the cycle 23 HST uh, cycle tw uh, 23 HST observing program, the PI is case Popovich at Texas So that provides uh, 10 to 20 orbit depth observations of uh, WFC G102 uh, region observation in 12 field in good south and good north. So what clear survey provides is wide dynamic range of galaxy coverage in terms of UV uh, magnitude compared to the other targeted ground-based observations, as it is uh, basically the blind survey. Uh, however, um, in, in inspection of the entire clear spectrum for these 150 redshift uh, six to eight galaxies, uh, we do not find a significant emission line or continuum detections from the entire data set. Uh, so, this is maybe due to both uh, the observational depth or the limit, limited um, scheme in the data reduction uh, for the solid based observations and also the increasing amount of neutral hydrogen into the organization. But still, uh, with non detections, uh, there are not many we can do uh, something interesting. So, what we decided from this data set is the combining this clear data set to our existing observation. So which comprise the entire, the two, over the 250 number of redshift six to eight galaxies, uh, which finally allows us to explore, explore the, the evolution of reporting scale depending on galaxy UV luminosity. So this plot showing, showing the clear uh, data set and overlapping on the previous CAC observations. So as I mentioned, we compri comprise the, the entire data set uh, from HST plus CAC combined data set at redshifts uh, 6 to 8.2 uh, that are shown in this bottom panel. So that shows uh, MUV distribution as a function of radio shifts. And, and from this panel, we, we can see here the wide dynamic range of UV magnitude from the clear that is the open circles compared to the targeted observation in our previous CAG observations. So that is the key part of the clear observations to explore this MUV dependency on our lineup of studies. Um, before getting into the result of the analysis, I, I wanna uh, touch about the advantages of putting the more non-detections in this analysis. So, um, so basically I'm talking about the, how much we can be benefited from including non-detections. Uh, and on the top left, uh, I'm showing the Lyman alpha detection limit in terms of flux and the equivalent risk limit. And, so even from the non-detections, we can still place upper limit of the Lyman alpha with a high equivalent risk uh, as shown in here. And in the right panel, the figure shows the simulated uh, simulation exercise on how the measurement of reporting scale risk uh, would be changed with including additional non-detections. And y, uh, y axis, I think, the x-axis is showing the multiplied number of non-detections uh, to the original data set. And the y-axis is showing the measurement of reporting scale width. And if we are adding the more non-detections, uh, which is basically bring more tighter upper limits to the data set, so your measurement is getting smaller. But the key, pro 
the key result is that you are able to get the smaller errors from the measurement. So yeah, we are still uh, benefiting from being benefited from including the non-detections. And with the clear data set at the bottom panels, I'm showing the updated measurement to our previous defaulting, the previous measurement of defaulting scale width uh, with the additional clear data set. So uh, on the left, I'm showing previous measurements and on the right, uh, that is from the updated value, including the clear data. So the updated value is getting reduced uh, by a little because we are adding the uh, non-detections here, but the error bar is also reduced by a half compared to the previous value. And uh, with that advantage, so now uh, I'm showing the key result of this study uh, that is about uh, Lyman alpha equivalent with distribution and IGN transmission depending on the UV magnitude of galaxies. So in my previous paper, Zhang uh, era 2020, we already attempted to measure uh, this quantity in different UV magnitude bins. And this measurement hints a slightly enhanced equivalent width for the brightest UV brightest galaxies, but the measurements uncertainties are dominating the difference. Now, uh, with the clear data set to the previous me measurement, and also we include the Keck Demos observations to the Keck Demos wire. Now we comp comprise the spectroscopic data for more than 250 galaxies, uh, which finally allows us to measure this uh, in different UV magnetic bands with a higher confidence level. So in this table that shows the measurement and it's visualized in, in the right panel. So this panel shows uh, a folding scale width as a function of uh, UV magnitude of galaxies. So our measurements as shown here uh, as a red dot here. And to compare that uh, dependence to the lower register measurements, uh, I'm showing the data point from the Santa Sierra 2020, which is taken from lower redshifts at redshift around the two to six. So at lower redshifts, what we are expecting to see on this evolving scale width is decreasing trend with the increasing uh, UV brightness. However, our measurement uh, that shows an upturn trend here for the bright UV brightest winds. So still uh, here, the, the error bars are overlapped. So the significance could be uh, buried in the uncertainties, but uh, I did sort of Monte Carlo approaches to validate this trend. And, and this upturn trend is valid at uh, likely one sigma confidence level. So 68% you know, of the simulation shows you this upturn trend. So it's getting more apparent from the previous studies. And, Still, we need more data to confirm this. Uh, but rather important, uh, importantly, so I also tried to measure the Lyman alpha transmission. That is a basically comparison between the evolving scale from the higher redshift compared to the lower redshifts. So that comparison reflect the Lyman alpha transmission in the IGM you know, as you go up to the epoch of realization. So. Uh, I'm showing that uh, IGM transmission as a function of UV magnitude here. And that plot obviously showing the boosted IGM transmission for Lyman alpha from the brightest galaxies. So uh, that is uh, one of the key findings uh, from this study. Yeah. So yeah, here I am uh, putting up uh, some fun cartoon picture to describe uh, what you can understand from our study. So our interpretation builds on, uh, which, which based on our recent observation that supports the inhomogeneous uh, process of I, uh, nature of IGN during reionization. So we, uh, our, this cartoon is just summarizing that inhomogeneous process at redshifts of over seven uh, that is consistent with the data and our interpretation. So 
here the dark, the, the, the black region shows the ionized medium, uh, while the neutral gas is represented as white color here. Um, so, so summarizing the figures, the galaxies uh, with high UV luminosity are likely forming the large ionized bubble around them. And those galaxies are likely located in the middle of overdense regions where they have more faint galaxies nearby. But still, uh, they are emitting uh, additional the ionizing photon budget to increase the size of ionized bubble around the UV bright galaxies. But for the UV faint uh, galaxies, they are likely uh, surrounded by the neutral hydrogen um, which is sitting in the smaller ionized bubble. So the lamina from those galaxies are likely hindered by the nearby neutral medium. But the lamina from these UV bright galaxies are likely to be detected uh, by our observations. And this picture is interestingly also supported by recent theoretical studies. So uh, the particularly, I worked with uh, Hyundai Park with the postdoc at uh, Berkeley Laboratory. And he uh, calculated lamina for transmission in the IGM from Cosmic Dawn 2 simulation uh, so the CODA2 simulation is a fully coupled hydrodynamic simulation with radiative transfer, uh, which to describe cosmic reionization. So using the CODA2 simulation, we calculate Lyman alpha opacity in 2000 cycle lines for individual galaxies in the simulation box. And the Lyman alpha opacity is described as a combination of neutral hydrogen density and the Lyman alpha scattering cross section shown here. And the key results are shown in the bottom panels. So this panel shows the Lyman alpha transmission in the IGM as a function of UV magnitude at different redshifts. So it's also suggesting that UV bright uh, galaxies are tend to uh, have enhanced the uh, IGM transmission uh, and also uh, they are located in the overdense regions in the simulation box, uh, where uh, nearby faint galaxies also can contribute on ionizing emissivity. So uh, our recent findings from observation are aligned with the theoretical expectation, so that is exciting. So uh, I here summarized the, the first part of the study. So, so we constrain effulgence scale width uh, depending on uh, UP absolute magnitude of galaxies. Uh, also try to infer uh, IGM transmission of the lemon alpha. And that shows the boosted the lemon alpha trans, uh, transmission uh, from the UV brighter galaxies. And that is also suggested from uh, theoretical models. So we interpret this as the sign of the inhomogeneous process of rearrangement uh, with a highly ionized IGM around the UV bright galaxies. Yeah, um, so from now on, uh, I, I will change the gear a little bit on a different topic uh, for a few minutes. So which is about selection effect on the Lyman alpha equivalent distribution. So it's rather uh, motivated by um, the survey scheme. So quick summary of the motivation of this study is here. The earlier, the old at all shows the continuum selected sample can bias the measurement of the folding scale width of Lyman alpha uh, toward the lower value, missing significant, significant population of Lyman alpha emitters uh, that are from the UP faint continuum sources. Um, so by including, uh, by analyzing the same uh, statistical quantity from the flux limited sample, they updated this reporting scale width, uh, which is much higher than uh, that from the continuum selected sample at register uh, 0 0.3. So, and also similarly, uh, in my previous work, uh, I, sh I showed already this plot, but here you can see a strong uh, disagreement between the studies. And interestingly, um, the image and line selection uh, selected studies suggest to a large equivalent risk compared to the 
the measurement taken from the continuum selected studies of mine and the Pantelich et al. 2018. So we want to figure out uh, we want to figure out if it's physical or the selection driven. So in order to do that, uh, we we utilize the huge wide data set, uh, which is publicly available and that provide extensive lemon alpha uh, emission line uh, sample in Boost South. So the goal of the study is to compare the equivalent risk measurements between the selection schemes. So I'm skipping the details, but here, uh, what I constructed uh, from the data set is uh, I classified the, the samples to create, to mark uh, observational data set. So one is emission line selected uh, sample, and this, the other is continuum selection uh, sample. So in this category, uh, I have 413 laminar families detected from user wide survey. And in here, the continuum selection, I include all the other Lyman bright galaxies in the same field uh, with, uh, with uh, Lyman alpha detec uh, detections from MUSE, but uh, they are associated with the Lyman uh, break selection as well. So basically, these two uh, sample selection represents emission line approach and continuum selection approach. And, and oh yeah, I'm going to skip this. And to the result, yeah. So <clears throat> here, yeah, sorry for the mess figures, but uh, here uh, on the top and the red dots are uh, sort of recovered sources from our emission line selection. So this figure showing the UV magnitude distribution as a function of red shifts. And you can see here, emission line selection recovers much more uh, MUV faint laminar parameters compared to the uh, continuum selection scheme. And I uh, estimate the folding scale width of the laminar parameters uh, based on the two different uh, selection schemes. And that is shown in the bottom panel. So Y axis is the folding scale as a function of different UV magnitude cut and also laminar for luminosity cut and uh, Lyman alpha flux cut. And the red data points are from the Lyman break selection, the so continuum selection. And the black data points are taken the emission line selection. And you can see here the measurement from the emission line selection generally provide larger value of the folding scale, which is basically due to uh, that the emission line scheme recovers more Lyman alpha emission from UV faint galaxies. But interestingly, here, if we apply the UV magnitude cut, that is the source of bias. So uh, the, the, for the Lyman break galaxy sample, the UV magnitude uh, limit is around between uh, minus 18 to minus 17.5. 17 so if we apply the, that UV magnitude cut to both data set, the measurements are you know, generally you know, more or less the same. So this demonstrates this measurement uh, bias is basically from the uh, continuum selection. Uh, that is what we expected. So here I'm showing uh, infolding scale measurement again from each selection. So in the left, initial line selection. On the, uh, on the right, continuum selection in different UV magnitude bins. And all the measurements of the infolding scale are the same if you uh, control the UV magnitude of the targets. So here is the summary of that uh, second part of the study. So our analysis shows that emission line selection scheme are recovering more UV faint sources, uh, which have a higher uh, equivalent risk lamina uh, emission. And that is the increase that uh, that is result resulting in the increased reporting scale risk uh, from that measurement. Uh, however, in the same UV magnetic bins, uh, if we apply the UV magnetic cut, uh, no clear selection bias between uh, emission line selection. So uh, in terms of applying or the comparison between the two different surveys, uh, my uh, impression from this result is that we, we need to control the MUV, so UV magnitude uh, in the data set between uh, different measurements. 
Yeah. Um, so, so far I presented a uh, recent result of my uh, Lyman alpha equivalent analysis about the neutralized infraction or the selection bias. Uh, but it seems that there are so many things to improve on this topic. So uh, I, I here want to discuss a list of the things that we need to explore in future. And the key direct measurement of this study is uh, in my studies, the Lyman alpha transmission of the IgM. And it can be estimated empirically like this. So the key quantity is observed the equivalent width and intrinsic properties of equivalent width. So to understand the equivalent property of Lyman alpha equivalent width, uh, we need to understand better uh, Lyman alpha transmission inside galaxies. So interstellar medium, which is depending on Lyman alpha velocity offset or the Lyman alpha emission line profile. And also we don't really know what's going on Lyman alpha transmission in extended uh, extended cloud of neutral hydrogen uh, in CGM. And the similar features have been observed in uh, mutual surveys. So we definitely need to understand the spatially extended Lyman alpha emission lines. Uh, also the escape fraction of the Lyman alpha and as well as the intrinsic Lyman alpha emitter fraction itself uh, from the entire galaxy population uh, that we need to figure out further in the future. And observationally, so slit loss or the spatial offset from our slit spectroscopic observations uh, from uh, many multi-object spectrograph and also uh, will be uh, used in JWST uh, that need to be uh, taken into account. So the variation of the equivalent width depending on the viewing angle or the slit positions uh, that need to be uh, carefully considered in, in measuring the observed equivalent risk. And also uh, photometric uncertainty needs to be improved uh, during the power of galaxies. And the, the lastly, the emission line detection scheme, uh, that is just still very difficult to, to uh, make a consistent search for faint emission line. Uh, that is another key, key uh, point to ensure the, the measurement of equivalent risk from observation. And also the size of binary structures getting bigger and bigger as you toward the end of your organization. So we need to expand the size of surveys. Yeah, so uh, what we need to do is uh, basically to, to do more detailed analysis of line of equivalent risk at slightly lower redshifts after reorganization. Uh, which provide the reference measure of the intrinsic Lyman alpha properties and also need more spectroscopic observations uh, for the reionization impact itself uh, in order to draw the Lyman alpha velocity offset or the other the ionization properties for the Lyman alpha emitters. And even from the nearby universe, uh, there are much more uh, ways of spectroscopic observations available. We will need to understand the Lyman alpha properties uh, from uh, for instance, low redshift analogs for high redshift galaxies that might be providing uh, uh, enhanced insight for the high redshift galaxies. A uh, great feature of JWST capability will allow us to study uh, most of these, but even before we uh, JWST, we uh, new observations from ground, uh, we are able to do uh, some part of these studies. So. I'm leading some of the, the Gemini and Mosfire observation programs uh, to continue to my Lyman alpha analysis. And also I'm part of the uh, Bender's uh, collaboration team to understand intrinsic Lyman alpha emitter properties at ratio to level six. Uh, also continue to collaborate with the theorists to, to understand uh, the physics behind the Lyman alpha emission. So uh, there are a lot more to show in the near future. And I wanna uh, finish this talk with introducing uh, this upcoming JWST observation. So uh, I'm part of the Sears JWST ERS program. 
uh, this program PI is the Steve Finkelstein, and this plot shows the observational designs and the key science goal are a lot more than this, but regarding the rearrangement and the Lyman alpha. So it will deliver uh, a few tens of Lyman alpha galaxies out to register to 10 and detect the numerous emission lines, including Lyman alpha and the other emission lines. So this figure shows the observed coverage from JWST, uh, depending on the, uh, in terms of relationships, depending on the emission line. So I'm collecting, I will collecting the emission line data set for relationships from six to nine galaxies, uh, which include these emission line observations. So um, and particularly, uh, so I want to mention, so uh, this is comes from question from Josh uh, in the meeting earlier. And so the expected, the nearest pack emission line limit from this survey uh, that is about uh, one to two times 10 to the minus 18 or per second uh, and centimeter square and in five sigma limit. So that is basically five times deeper than the current DPS to MOSFET observation of nine. So uh, there will be around the, at least 40, uh, uh, the, the spectroscopic observations available for around 40 galaxies uh, from this single program. So yeah, that will be exciting. And I'm uh, working on the MOSFET program to fit spectroscopically confirmed the target for that planned uh, JWS observations. And and luckily, we detect likely 10 Lyman alpha candidate uh, galaxies from that most high observations targeted in the Sears uh, EGS field. So uh, they are likely to be the first target in the JWS observation. Uh, so stay tuned for the uh, future news. And I will stop here and take questions. Great, thank you, Hintai. Uh, yeah. If we have questions, we have plenty of time. Yeah. Sorry, I ran over the time. Yeah. Oh, you're good. We still got um, yeah. a good few minutes here if anybody has questions. So. Oh, yeah. I actually have one of the slides, but yeah, just leaving the next. Mm -hmm. So yeah, basically we will have a much brighter future with Lyman Alpha with other combination of the future planned service. Uh, uh, I think yeah, uh, someone... yeah, Michael, you have a question? Um, yeah, thank you very much for an interesting talk. Uh, uh, my question is um, for the Lyman Alpha selected galaxies, um, would, they, the, would there have been discrepant photometric redshifts in some cases? I mean, are the continua always as a, uh, Predicted for the photometric redshift, or are they steeper? Uh, sorry, uh, see, do, do the photometric yeah. yeah. uh, mm -hmm. for Lyman alpha selected galaxies? Uh, do the photometric redshifts agree with the Lyman alpha redshift, or do you get some uh, right. surprises sometimes? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's part of the key outcome from my previous study. So the compare we compare the spectroscopic redshifts from our Lyman alpha emitters to the photometric redshifts, and they are mostly agree very well. So the so far the photometric redshifts measurements are sort of successful, even for redshifts above seven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, uh, if not, let's thank Inte again for a really nice talk and thanks everyone for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me today. And enjoy of course, thank the you. weekend. Thank you. Thanks thank everyone. Thank you very much. Bye.